Okay, I think I'll, uh, I'll begin. So for this afternoon, we're going to be doing uh, some hands-on training. So uh, this morning we talked about the theory and maybe the motivation. Um, and now we will show you how to use our actual codes. So I'm not going to go into presenter mode, so that way I can switch between the VM and uh, PowerPoint easily, and hopefully uh, that'll work well. Um, let me know if I'm going too fast or um, stuff isn't showing up, or if you have any other questions. And I'll keep an eye on chat, and Song will let me know if I missed something. So uh, the name of our CTQMC code is com CTQMC, sort of following our uh, convention of putting a com for com scope or center in front of our code names. Um, and the, what we have on the, the virtual machine is um, a little bit different than what uh, com suite, like the com DMFT, GW plus DMFT codes are using. Um, just about to release a new version. And what you have is that sort of near release version um, because the uh, CPC article is just about to come out. And I'll be putting up um, the GitHub with my code and all the documentation uh, following that. Um, if you look in your VM, this is where you want to be. This is the sort of version of the CTQMC uh, I have for you. Um, and if we look, there is um, a user guide in the directory user guide. Um, there are examples in examples. Um, and while not 100% up to date with the very latest features, um, the user guide should be comprehensive for anything I'm going over now and for really any typical use. Uh, mostly it's uh, sort of the cutting edge features I've been working on with um, Song or other developers to help mesh this into DMFT codes and to get particular results. Might not be perfectly documented, but uh, hopefully everything else is. Um, so to start, I think is uh, it's good just to maybe give you a brief tour of what's going on in this code. So there are two, two main codes here. There is CTQMC, which does the main CTQMC algorithm. So it samples the partition space or the worm spaces collects observables. Um, this is the parallelizable code. And it's the GPU accelerated code. Um, but it outputs sort of raw data on the estimators. Um, but what you as a user probably want is um, the post-process versions, which are, say, the self-energy on the matzo bar axis. Um, and a val sim, or for evaluate the simulation, is what transforms this data, this raw data, into uh, nice uh, results. And it does things like adds the asymptotic region of these objects so that you don't have to rely just on raw sampling of high frequencies. Um, it'll use the reduced density matrix to calculate static observables. Um, and so it's quick. Um, unless you're working on an extremely hard problem um, where it can take a bit of time to do some of the linear algebra. Um, but in almost all cases, it's very quick to run. Um, so while it's pretty much serial, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you'll just run this quickly. A laptop can handle this. Uh, it's really no issue. Uh, these are both C++ codes. CTQMC also has some CUDA to handle the GPU code. Um, they use MPI and on the CPU, LAPAC, LAPAC and BLAS or whatever linear algebra 
um, equivalent you have on your machine. And uh, it's bundled with Cutlass, which is a library from NVIDIA, which does um, matrix multiplication kernels for you. So uh, for the GPU. So this is essentially doing what LeFact and Blast are doing for us on the host for the local tricks. In addition, if you look in the bin directory, there's a Python script uh, plot.py, which I just made and hopefully won't have any issues for you. Um, that'll help you visualize the results we're going to generate today or in the future if you want to look at things. Uh, and finally, it can also generate a, a library in case you want to embed this in whichever in a DMFT code you're working on. So um, I think it's uh, somewhat important to point out here that this is not the sort of code you're probably going to be running by hand. Um, and it's probably something you will put into a bigger project. So you need some way to generate a good quantum impurity problem, um, let's say a DMFT code or let's say a periodic Anderson model code. Um, and that's generally what's going to be calling the CTQMC algorithm of choice. And so I have both the exec executable and also a library, whichever um, code wants to use. Uh, compilation is, uh, there are two options available. On the VM, you can only use the first, which is just make. Um, but there's essentially a configuration file, makefile.in, where you'll set uh, what compilation flags, compilers, where your libraries are located. Um, and if you look, there are some examples in makefile underscore examples. The makefile used for the VM is this makefile gnu.in. So if you just copy that into the main directory, you can just uh, run make and it'll build the executables. Or you can do um, make lib and it'll make the library. Um, alternatively, there's CMake, um, which is a way to sort of build configuration files automatically uh, and make files. So you can just make a build directory and run CMake, and you just have to tell it where CMake lists is, which um, is in that base directory. And then it'll run and find all the configurations you need, hopefully. Um, this won't work on your virtual machine because you sort of you need a newer version of CMake because I'm using some options to uh, figure out what kind of GPU you have and um, get the best optimization options, um, which the older CMakes didn't have or have changed. So, but if you're building this on a cluster, in my experience, this is a really good way to do things. Um, and uh, if you end up compiling my code, I would appreciate if you have problems with CMake to let me know so that I can uh, make a better, a better version of the CMake lists. Okay, so let's uh, dive into using it. So first we're gonna go to sort of the examples, Hubbard. Um, in here, there are a number of files, um, which are things that you need to input as well as some outputs. So there are already some, some of what you can expect here. What you actually need as input is this frams.json, which is your input file describing the simulation, and hive.json, which is describing your hybridization functions. So if you look at this input file using whichever editor you want, you can see um, the structure of this file. So it's in the JSON format, which is essentially just a dictionary pairing a key with the value or a key with another dictionary with keys and values. Uh, first, we have sort of the control parameters, what temperature, what chemical potential, 
this is a complex valued impurity. Um, if you're using GPUs, how many Markov chains do you want to run on the GPU? Um, if you're not using GPUs, as on this virtual machine, this is ignored. Um, how, many, how many minutes do you want to spend measuring? And how many minutes do you want to spend thermalizing? Um, so this warrants uh, a short discussion. Um, so CTQMC is creating this Markov chain, looking at these um, configurations in the partition space, let's say. At the beginning, it might not be in a physical region of the configuration space. It's starting at you know, expansion order zero, and that has to build up to whatever region is typical, maybe expansion order 100. And this can take some time. Um, so you need to give it some time to reach there. For this problem, one minute is more than enough. Um, and the measurement time, this is how long it's going to actually spend after thermalizing, measuring everything. Then we have blocks describing the atomic Hamiltonian. So what is the hopping matrix? And what's the attraction tensor U, I, J, K, L? Um, there are also some ways to automate construction of this two-body tensor. I'll show you some examples later, um, which are really useful for real materials. And then we have a block describing hybridization. So where do we find the hybridization functions? Um, here it's hybe.json, but you can name it whatever you want. And what does your hybridization matrix look like? So here we have functions in hybe.json named A. We're saying we have a diagonal hybridization matrix where the spin up is hybridized to A and the spin down is hybridized A. Um, because we're just in a one band Hubbard model, those are the only, the only orbitals we have. And then we have a series of blocks describing all of the configuration spaces we might sample. So partition space or Green's function space, susceptibilities in the particle hole channel, particle particle, heat and susceptibilities, vertexes. You see at the end, I have little dashes. Uh, this is essentially me turning off this sampling um, because the, the code is going to look for the word green and it's not going to find. It's not going to know green dash. So if you want to sample any of these spaces, you can try by just common or deleting a dash from a space. Um, in the time we'll be running, you probably won't have the ability to converge any worm space other than maybe a grains function. Um, but you can still get results and see how it works. Um, so. Let me describe some of these flags in these spaces. So partition is sort of special. There's lots of different things we can sample in this space. Um, first, we can choose you know, what basis do we want to sample the Green's function. We have Matsubara or Legendre as options. This green bullet is essentially, do you want to use improved estimators? Um, this. Uh, special operator at the front of the estimator is called a bull operator, which is the um, commutator of the operator with interaction matrix. What energy do we want to sample up to? Um, note that everything in the action is dimensionless. So this is just based on, this could be EV if your chemical potential is an EV and your two bodies in EV, et cetera, whatever energy scale you're using. Um, do you want to measure susceptibilities and use um, improved estimators? Do you want to measure quantum number susceptibilities? Um, these are sort of more advanced options, but essentially there are some tricks we can use to measure certain types of susceptibilities in partition space, uh, either just occupation numbers or things, uh, quantum numbers of the, the Hamiltonian are the two sort of things we can sample easily. And you have to tell it, if you're sampling quantum numbers, what type. I'll be talking a little bit of more about quantum numbers later. Um, the number of particles is always a good quantum number. Um, this is spin on the z-axis. 
this is going to typically be a good quantum number unless you have a relativistic calculation, uh, although not always. And then just like we have energy cutoffs for the Green's function, we have energy cutoffs for our susceptibilities. Um, and this tail is how many frequency components to add um, using the asymptotics of the susceptibility. For these worm, worm functions, it's a little bit simpler. It's generally what basis do you want? How many frequencies do you want? And then what kind of improved estimator or non-improved estimator do you want? Um, by default, it'll use improved estimators, but you can specify if you want to use uh, non-improved by just putting a empty field. We also have uh, sort of a different version of the improved estimator, um, but it's, in my experience, strictly worse. So it was mostly for testing purposes. Um, where instead of this commutator, essentially you get a sum over different operators. So we have the, the full sum in one operator, or you can sample individual parts of that, which is the uh, just this, um, but I wouldn't worry about it. You can just uh, leave out this option and the code will just do the best thing typically. Uh, if it's, um, an observable with multiple times, you'll need to give cutoffs for both the fermionic and bosonic times here. So we have two different cutoffs. Um, so that's most of the input file. Uh, if you're stuck in BIM, it's uh, colon Q to get out. Um, if you change something, colon WQ. Let's see, what else? Yeah, let's look at this. So here are the hybridization functions. As I said there's just one that I've called A. This can be any string. Uh, as long as in the parameter file, you have the matrix with that string. And we have the imaginary part, the real part, some certain number of frequencies that gets us into a nice uh, smoothly going to zero region, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Again, this is something you're not going to make by hand. You will need a code to generate these for you so that they're physical. Um, so these are the inputs. And then when the code runs, it's going to add to your parameter file everything else that it, you could possibly have added, all the defaults, essentially. So you can take a look to see what else you might add. And then you can look at the user guide for an explanation of those things. As you can see, there's lots of different options. Um, what I have is relatively minimal in your parameter file. OK, so to run it, we just go to the um, bin directory, which is down two levels, and it's called ctqmc. And then we need to tell it what the name of our parameter file is, in this case, params. And we just start running. Um, so we told it to take a minute to do thermalization. So that's what it's doing now. After a minute, it'll start taking measurements, and that'll happen. That'll go on for four minutes. Now, while that's going on, I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing and some some discussion while we're waiting for this all to finish. Um, first thing is we see in this output what are the number of invariant subspaces and what's the dimension of the largest subspace. Uh, in my previous talk, I was talking about how we decompose the Hilbert space based on its symmetries into subspaces. This is telling us how many subspaces CTQMC has found and what the rank of the largest one is. So this will give us an idea of how hard our problem is. Um, in this case, because it's just a Hubbard model, we, do, we can completely decompose the Hilbert space, which is why this is uh, such an easy problem for CTQMC. 
although it still has to deal with the hybridization weights um, and they'll be the bottleneck for us here. So the, the first thing, and then we get a bunch of output, which if you get crashes and you email me about them, they'll help me figure out where it's happening and might give you some idea about what parameter file options you're maybe setting wrong or um, if you have an unphysical thing going on, uh, this can help. But it's just talking about all the setup, essentially. After thermalization, you'll get a list of ADA for each configuration space you're sampling. In this case, we're only sampling partition space. Um, these ADAs are essentially the relative size of each configuration space. So during thermalization, we're also computing these relative sizes using the Wang Landau algorithm. So if you, let's say, turned on green um, to test that out, the green uh, sampling in the warm space, you also get green eta equals point something, probably. Um, and it also means once you see that, that thermalization is done, and now we're on into measurement. Um, so if you want to see what that looks like, you can try changing this input in the parameter file to green instead of green hyphen, and you can run. Um, I should also mention running it like this is just using one core. If you want to use two, you can do MPI run dash n2, same thing. Um, but it shouldn't really matter too much. For example, you'll just get uh, some better results than the rest of us. So a bunch of files are going to get produced. Um, I'm going to stop my run to show you these. Uh, you can either follow along or let your run complete. So this tells us how many measurement steps were taken, how many markup chains we were simulating. So this run I have in the directory was with two cores and there were two MPI processes. So these will be equal unless you're using the GPU code. And then the number of steps we took during thermalization. There is defaults, which I already talked about, which is sort of all of the input parameters you set without realizing it by not specifying something. Um, there's params.measure.json, which is the raw raw results. Um, and this is stored in a like base 64. So not only is it not physical, but it's also not human readable. Um, but this makes these files quite a bit smaller. Um, and then if you ran this in parallel, you'll get something called params.error.json, which is our estimate of how good your, your measured quantities were. So this looks at the estimate between each MPI rank and then uses the jackknife method to come up with an error estimate based on how different they are from each other, essentially. Um, you can also do this in serial, although you have to run your CTQMC over and over to keep getting some idea of how good the, the estimates are. Um, and these, these estimates are also not going to be great for us because we just have two processes that we're comparing between each other. Um, but if you're running a real material, probably you're using you know, 50 to 1,000 CPUs. And these will be very good estimates of your error. Um, so this is a good thing to check to see if you're giving enough measurement time, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. We also have these config.x files, where x is uh, 0, 1, 2, up to the number of Markov chains you've run. Um, without GPUs, this is up to the number of CPUs you've used, which store the configuration of each Markov chain. That way, when you're rerunning this, let's say in DMFT, thermalization happens a lot quicker. Um, 
And then when you're done, and it would be helpful if someone types in chat once the once the run is done, um, you run this. So oops. you run a Velsim. It sounds like you guys are descending, so that's great. So this will almost instantly go and it'll just translate this params.measure.json into params.observables.json. And now this will show all of your process functions and all of the observables. We've told it to sample and that it can sample. Um, and there's a lot in here, which the user guide um, gives a description of. You see here our average sign. This is an important one. Um, in this case, it's just one uh, because it's the Hubbard model. There's no sign problem. Um, but probably an easier way to look at these than looking at this long string of numbers is I've made this Python script um, plot. I misspell this. These are plots. Huh. Add bean. What's that? You oh, I forgot add bean. Right. Yeah, yeah, bean. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, you can say what configuration space you want to pull an observable from. By default, it'll look at the partition. You can say what uh, observable you want to look at. So you can put green, self energy, um, expansion histogram. Um, and you, if you aren't using params as your run name, you can set it here. So if we just do it by default, it'll show self energy. It should pop up. And you see this plot um, or something like it. Probably you see a different plot because this is a stochastic thing. The errors aren't going to be the same between our runs, but it should look similar. Um, if you look at the green function, you should see pretty much exactly what I have because this converges so quickly. Um, and here you can see sort of another example of what your self energy might look like, which probably you have this start looking pretty similar and then the end might look different. Um, you can also look at this expansion histogram. So CTQMC will keep track of what expansion orders it's in as it samples. Um, and you'll see here um, this sort of nice distribution around the average expansion order of 15 or 16. Maybe that get the same result more or less. Um, so I think a useful thing to do now is just to talk about um, a little bit of troubleshooting and guidance. Um, so how do you actually create these inputs? Usually you need to write your own DMFT code. Um, or if you're using ComSuite, it's going to generate most of these for you. You'll probably just have to select a few parameters, which Song will talk about. But it's actually not too hard to create your own DMFD code just for a simple Hubbard model. So if you want to, you know, get into this, this is a good uh, practice writing for a simple Hubbard model um, and using this input file as an example. Um, but what your code will need to figure out is 
also how to describe this atomic Hamiltonian. We provide some uh, help here. So you go into, let's say, into the plutonium example. Um, I can say what basis I'm working in. So coupled is the sort of relativistic basis, it's spin orbit coupled. Um, and instead of having to enter, enter a horrible interaction tensor that would be very, very long, we can just say, we're going to use a slater condon interaction with some f parameters, and we're not going to use the icing approximation. It'll generate a nice attraction tensor. Um, and you can rotate this basis with some transformation. And there's also a um, basis for uh, D shell materials that are not spin orbit coupled. So we can use a product, a real product basis, um, which is described in our article or in the user guide, uh, much like the product, the coupled basis is. Um, so I think the most critical thing, and the thing that you'll actually deal with with um, our DFT plus DMFT codes or GW plus DMFT is how much time do I actually give to CTKMC? What's a good thermalization time? What's a good measurement time? Um, unfortunately, there's no great way for CTKMC to know if it's thermalized or for you to know, um, aside from testing. So you can just do a CTKMC. It'll save the old configuration. You can do another one. If your results changed, it means there's probably some more thermalization to do, or you can increase your thermalization time. If the results change, probably you need more thermalization. Um, these configuration files are going to save you a lot of thermalization time. So if you're doing DMFT, which will require a bunch of successive CTQMCs, probably you don't need much thermalization, you know, just one to five minutes. And my experience is fine. Um, by the end of the DMFT, it'll be well thermalized. Even if the first iteration isn't, it's not really going to cause problems. Um, uh, measurement time. So since you'll probably be running in parallel, you'll have this error file. And the relative error at the highest frequency sampled of like 10 to 20 percent uh, is good to get a converged DMFT. Um, and the error tends to decrease with measurement time like uh, exponentially. So you need to give quite a bit of time to let's say get to 1%, more than you need to get to 10%. And um, if you really want to be sure, you want to just want to plot this for your first run and try to figure out, OK, I just need 10 minutes to get down to 10% error. Or if you don't want to deal with that, you can just look at your self energy. Um, so if I look at um, this plot of the self energy, there's a lot of wobbliness. It's not terrible. I would say this is probably fine to continue. I would guess if you look at this error, it's not more than 20%. Um, but if you were running for this for less time, you might have tons of wobbliness here, and it's clear you're not converged. That's not sort of physical behavior. At the high frequencies, it should be smoothly going to zero. Um, so for example, you get something like this, you need more time. converged. Um, an important factor here is this cutoff. So CTQMC is adding an asymptotic tail after the sam last sampled frequency you asked for uh, in your parameter file. So you want to make sure you're not going up to too high of frequencies or you're going to get way more noise than you need. 
Um, and you don't want to go too low or there'll be weird kinks in your self energy when you transition from the last thing I've measured to the first part of my uh, high frequency tail or here you can see that kink even better. Um, but if I choose the cutoff just right, I'll get some smooth transition from sampled frequencies to asymptotic tail. All of these have the same amount of measurement time, but we can sort of see there's much better error here than here. Um, and some, do you think I'm a little over my expected time? Do you think you need? It's okay. Correct. It's okay. Okay. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is these quantum numbers. So if we look here in the input parameter or input file, I have a list of quantum numbers. For this Hamiltonian. In the main CTQMC algorithm, if you're not measuring these susceptibilities and you're not using a dynamical um, interaction on one of these quantum numbers, which I'll talk about a little bit, then they're not used. So you don't need to do, you don't need to deal with this. Um, which is nice because what you think is a quantum number might not be an actual good quantum number for this interacting Hilbert space. Um, and CTQMC will crash because it thinks you need these to do things in the algorithm. Um, so if you're not using quantum number susceptibilities, you're not using dynamical interactions, you can leave this out um, and you can put it in for the post-processing step. So if I put this in just for the eval sim, it'll tell me some observables related to this. So what's the average number? What's the average spin? I'll get this sort of input because I put this field here, but I only need to put it for eval sim if I'm not using them for susceptibilities or dynamical interactions. Um, and eval sim is smart enough to tell me, okay, this particular quantum number is not actually, I don't agree that this is a quantum number. I know warn you and you can you know, figure out a little bit easier and it won't waste uh, some queuing time, let's say if you're working on a, a national cluster. So what are these? They're just an array of values corresponding to each orbital on the impurity. We use these to define some bilinears, which uh, you have to use to describe the dynamical interaction. So um, the dynamical interaction can only be applied on using these bilinears essentially, otherwise CTQMC can't handle them. Um, or in other words, what are these quantum numbers? These quantum numbers, they're numbers that allow these bilinears to commute with the Hamiltonian. Um, so the number is always good because each sector of the Hilbert space will always have its own unique number of particles or the spin is often a good number for non-relativistic. Jz um, five half, seven half is often a good number. Um, for relativistic, but it depends if you're doing these unitary transformations, maybe J squared is better than JZ, maybe S squared is better than SZ. Um, you just have to be careful. Uh, and CTQMC can test for you. Um, this is sort of advanced if you're trying to deal code dealing with these dynamical interactions. It's it's much harder for a CTQMC to handle them. So we have to be careful about how we construct them. The other thing that can cause problems is uh, in your input functions. So you're supplying
this hybridization function for a certain number of Matsubara frequencies. If you do too few, uh, it won't have started entering this region in space where you know it's nicely going to zero. These are self energies which don't go to zero, but the hybridization should, like the imaginary part does. So if your hybridization truncates here in what you're giving CTTMC, it's going to make some assumptions that it can Fourier transform based on some tail it's going to add. And the tail it adds is not going to be the real tail because you haven't added enough hybridization uh, frequencies. So you want to make sure you've entered that region of space where they're smoothly decreasing, or you'll get really unphysical hybridization um, elements in the matrix. And you'll get overflows and underflows potentially. You'll definitely get bad results. If you don't, you might get crashes from the uh, class SOL, which is our big number class. Um, and you probably, if you don't know about this, you'll just be confused. Um, in my experience, this is from unphysical functions, uh, either dynamical or hybridization, or um, not giving enough. Uh, this is a good question from Daniel. Is there a good rule of thumb for selecting the frequency cutoff for the tails? Slash, does it vary a lot with materials? In my experience, for measurements, uh, going up to 10 to 15 electron volts is pretty good. Um, it's usually good. And for the input hybridization functions, um, the same is typically true. There's not too much cost to going overboard with hybridization functions. So um, it's better to err on the side of caution. There's really no penalty to providing, in this case, um, you know, this is figured exactly how many components I put in here, way more than I need. If you were to plot this, this would be well into the asymptotic region, and that's fine. Uh, unlike the cutoffs for measurement, we know this function to high frequencies in the DMFT code, probably. Um, and there's no measurement error associated with those high frequency components. So err on the side of caution if you're concerned. Um, but otherwise, staying with the same 10 to 15 EV is probably fine. Uh, I think you might need slightly higher costs for dynamical interactions, but I'm much less experienced with those. Um, Song might be able to say a bit better about that during his talk. Um, And that's the end. Uh, does anyone have any particular questions about using this code? Uh, probably most of you will be working with it through DFT plus DMFT or GW plus DMFT, in which case you don't need to know nearly as much. Um, but it, it's helpful for troubleshooting or when you're talking about your results, you can sort of see a bit better what's happening, I think. so. Even if you don't need all this detail, uh, I expect it will probably help you in the long run. Um, but yeah, any, any questions? Well, it doesn't look like it. So if you end up using this code standalone, um, feel free to contact me through the Slack or through email and I'll be happy to help you compile it or use it or problem solve, add uh, easy enough observables for you. Um, happy to do those sorts of things. So yeah, just contact me if you have more questions. Otherwise, I'll hand this over to Song.
Okay, then I will share my screen. Corey, do you see the PPT and the virtual machine here? And yeah. chat box here? Do you see all of that? Yeah, I see PowerPoint and virtual, virtual box. Machine. Is the virtual box? Yeah, I think it's not cut off. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, do you see the mouse pointer too? Yes. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, guys, this is time for the hands-on session for the COM DMFT code as a part of the COM suite packages. And here I note that in this tutorial, the, all the commands you should learn in terminal are marked by red colors. So if you're not <clears throat> familiar with the terminal, just follow the red color. And if you see the red color uh, command line, then just follow it and type it here. And at the same time, I will show you what happens uh, if you type the command in the virtual machine here. So I hope there is not that any problems. Okay, let's go. Oh, and start to start, I should really thanks to Vincent Sachstetter for installing and testing COM suite and COM DMFT part a code in the virtual machine. Okay. To before go into details, I should advertise you where the COMC packages are located. It, it can be shared using the GitHub uh, site. And as you can see here, there is some short introduction there and we, we release new version every year. So the latest one is released in February 26 uh, this year. And we have <coughs> all the source code together with tutorials. So if you go into this tutorial uh, page, then there will be all the tutorial for the DFT, LDA for CMFT, LQSGW and LQSGW plus DMFT. And at the same time, uh, there is input file and, the, and then there is also PPT, uh, PDF file, uh, which just show you all the command you should run uh, in terminal. So maybe you can enjoy the tutorial after this hands-on session. And there is also compiled instruction. So there is a detailed instruction so that you can just follow it. But at this time for this hands-on session, you don't have to do it thanks to Vincent and we can continue. Okay, so before going into the hands-on session, I'd like to advertise it more. So, so rationale of the COM DMFT project as a part of COM suite is as follows. So for the validation and to increase, to make the community code based on the first principles and the DMFT methodology, we should have open source packages. And at this time, our COM DMFT packages are open source under uh, BSD license. Actually, this is BSD, not GPL, so I should correct it. And in it, there are multiple methodologies based on the ab initial LQS GW plus DMFT. Here I stress that this is not the full GW plus DMFT. However, this is a simplification of the full GW plus EDMFT. And we also have, we also support charge self consistent LDA plus DMFT methodology, as well as there is also a version of the COM suite packages, which is so-called COM RISB, and it supports LDA plus RIBS uh, rotation invariant slave version methodology, and it will be taught tomorrow by Yongxing and uh, Nicola. And this is the first open source packages supporting Abinitio G double plus DMFT. And this is the first open source packages supporting multiple methodologies based on the first principles plus uh, DMFT. And as Corey introduced you, it has GPU support and we make use of the COM uh, CTQMC code as, a, as our impurity server so that for the COM CTQMC part, we have GPU support. Okay, so if you run COM DMFT packages, there are several physical value observables you can calculate. One is a single particle grains function, and you can also calculate the, all the local quantities for the correlated orbitals, such as impurity self energy, hybridization function, and double counted self energy for the case of LQS G double plus DMFT 
as well as you can also calculate bosonic vice field within CRPA for the case of the LQS G double plus T. So at this point, we have support for the paramagnetic phase as well as anti-ferromagnetically ordered phases. And we can also calculate the quasi-particle band within the LD plus T as well as LQS G double plus T by the idea of the filtering and then, then rescaling. And for the LDA and LQSGW part of the code, we use a flap MVPT. And we also, for the CTQMC part, we use COM CTQMC packages. OK, so let's go into detail for the tutorials. So source code is located at the home, max, codes. Uh, and there is, it should be compiled. Uh, Sam, there's one question. Uh -huh. Okay, it is from Hongbin. Uh, so at this point, the support for the ferromagnetic phases is not available for the public version, but we will uh, release it soon. Did I answer you, Hongbin? I think I answered. Okay, thank you. So the source code is located at the, so here I'm working on this terminal here. So source code is located at, at home, max, calls and compiled. Uh, so com suite code and com suite version two and source code. Yeah, right. So this should be compiled. Uh, uh, com suite code. Yeah, it should be like this. And there, if we just do uh, ls, then there are many directories, and we also set up file to compile the packages and uh, all the directory, which is important, as is as follows. First, we have com ctqmc directory, where we have com ctqmc uh, packages, which is developed by Patrick and Corey, and we have com clone packages here, which is calcul to calculate the bosonic bias field within the CRPA. And we also have com DC packages here, which calculate the double counting energy within the local GW approximation, so that we use these packages for the LQS GW uh, plus DMFT methodology only. And we also become low H directories where we have. Uh, uh, modules to calculate fermionic phase field, density of state, and spectral function. And we also have become RISP packages, which is for the driller. So I will not deal with it today. And we also have become BOM packages, which is just connecting the flap MBPT code and Bani and IT packages for the construction of the Bani functions. And we have also copyright instruction and make file and lead me files, and we also beam file, which is just contains all the Python script to run the cat packages. And we also have a copy of the Andre's flap MPPT packages. And we also have a tutorial for the nickel oxide and iron selenide. So if you want it, I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, you can contact me anytime using the Slack. And this is all the directory you should be, uh, you should know about. Another question, Song? Okay. So it is from the way. Okay. So what his question is, what does COM low H do and, and whether you can do interpolation of the GW band structure? So one of the role of the COM low H is, as you said, it just interpolates LQS GW band structure. But at the same time, it also calculates the fermionic bias field, which is, uh, which is related to the hybridization function and impurity level. And you can also calculate, do some laws for the density of state calculation as well as spectral function. Did I answer you, Wei Yi? You can also yeah, interpolate okay. DFT bands, right? Yes, 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 for the DFT. Uh, yeah, it, maybe that is a point. Yeah, it interpolate the DFT as well as the LQSGW band structure, uh, depending on the methodology we are using. 
Okay, so to follow the instruction, uh, the hands-on session, first what you need to do is we should check whether environmental variables are uh, correctly set up. So in the terminal, please type echo come sweep in and check if uh, the environmental variable are correctly set. So I will do it here, echo uh, come sweep in. Then it says that in my cases, it says it is there. So we don't have to worry about it. And we have one more question from Wei Yi. How will this interpolation have an individual tutorial DOC? Uh, so, okay. So we don't have individual, individual tutorial for the band structure interpolation. However, uh, uh, but we don't have specific instruction for that. However, what does the COM low HG package do is the interpolation. Uh, part of it is the interpolation of the band structure. Did I answer you? Okay, let me continue. So it says the these environmental variables are correctly set up. So I hope that I'm sure that you also have the same answer by uh, using this command. However, when you're compiling code by yourself on your some other machine, if this is not set up in the bash RC file, then there will be really big problem. So that in the cases, you should add the following lines in the, in the bash RC uh, file if you're using bash shell and you should the, execute the bash RC set of file again, and you should this set up this uh, directory name correctly. Otherwise, code will not work. This is important part. So here I assume that you also are in the same pages that you your com suite bin directory are correctly set up. So I will continue. And here I also stress that what you need to do is just follow the lad command, uh, a command with the lad color. So just just follow that. Okay. Then it's time to run the DFT calculation. Uh, uh, the, first, you need to copy the, all the input files. So I, I created all the input files for the hands-on session. So please copy it to your home directory following using this command code, compiled, compiled, suite code. Home suite version two tutorial input and copy to the home directory. I hope you didn't see any problems. And then let's go into the tutorial inputs. And if you go into the directory, there is four different subdirectory, which is TFT, where we have TFT inputs. And we also have a LDA plus CMFT directory where we have LDA plus CMFT input. And we have LKS GW directory where we have LKS GW plus LKS GW input. And we also have a LDA underscore DMFT directory where we have the input file for the LKS GW plus DMFT. Okay, I think all you're okay, but if you see any problem, please just type something in the chat box so that I I, I should know about it. Okay, so our first part is the LDA plus DMFT tutorial for the sodium. Here, I stress that because we have limited computational resources, we are using our virtual machine on our, on our laptop. So that all the parameter for the calculation are set to run on two CPU cores in an hour. So, so this means that once you run the, all the calculation, your final result, you will get something. However, it will not be fully converted in terms of the number of K points and CTQMC measurement and LDA plus DMT full iteration. So it will not be converted, but the converted calculation, which I run for you is located at here. So in the tutorial session, uh, when I visualize the final results, I will show you the results located here. So if you, if you are interested in going into this subdirectory, which is located here, 
and take a look at the final results. And this result will be uh, somewhat different from what you will get after by running your examples in your virtual machine. And another comment is that simple metal, including sodium, is not the best material for the local self-energy assumptions, which is intrinsic in the DMFT calculation. But I chose this sodium examples because this is computationally one of the cheapest one, so that for if you want to see the real power of the DMFT calculation, then I want you to go into the tutorial in the source code and follow the tutorial uh, in the in the in tutorial directory in the in the in the packages where you can see the example of nickel oxide as well as iron selenide. Okay. Let's go to the next pages. I hope that you guys don't see any problems. So the goal of this hands-on session is first, you will run the LDA plus CMFT set constant equation, a calculation. And from there, I hope you will be, you will be able to calculate quasi particle band structure within LDA plus CMFT. Okay. So for the LD plus CMFT, what we usually do is first we are starting our calculation from the fully converted LDA calculation. So what you need to do is it means what you need to do is we first should run the DFT calculation. So let's go into the DFT directory. Okay, here we go to DFT and check the, the input file. Then we have one input file for the uh, for the flap MPPT DFT run, which is name is comdmft.99, and we have a crystal crystallographic information file, which is just tells us how the, the crystal structure of the material we are interested in is looking like. But we have this two input file only, and let's run it by typing this command com sweet in comdmft. Hi. Okay, I hope you don't see any problems. And you just set up the flap MPT file, and then you just run the flap MPT using two cores, and it gives us the how the total energy charge density changes as a function of iteration, as well as how <coughs> we how the free energy changes as a function of iteration. And in the meantime, let's take a look at what is in the input file. So this is the input file for the DFT run using COM DMFT packages. Here I also stress that uh, for the DFT and LQS GW run, we are using the Andre's flap MPPT code, but this is the version of the code which is a little bit older than what Andre is, is usually nowadays working on. However, but for the but it is self-contained so that you can just follow this uh, this tutorial. And in the input for the input file for the DMFT calculation, it is composed of the uh, Python dictionaries. One dictionary key is the control, and the other one dictionary key is a flap MPPT. And in the dictionary, we also have key. Uh, this is the dictionary name here, and we have key and value, key and value, key and value, and key and value. And all the keys are written in the small uh, uh, lowercase uh, letter. And we have all the values that I will describe the meaning soon. And first, the key in the control dictionary is the method. So, using within the COM DMFT, you can make choices of the evidential methodology. It can be DFT, it can be LQS GW, it can be LDA plus CMFT, and it can be LQS GW plus CMFT. Uh, the calculation has been finished. I hope you get the same answer. And in the meantime, I got a question from Victor. Let me read it. And okay, so for the number of cores, I will describe it here, Victor. So look at this. And for the MPI prefix, uh, we are supposed to put the MPI prefix, <coughs> MPI prefix in the dictionary as a dictionary key. The, but uh, but here I just set up set it two. I will use two cores, but this value will be should be the same one less than the number of processors when you are setting up the virtual machines. So I hope you use the same number as this one. This is the virtual machine manager of the first pages. So take a look at it 
and check it and use this number. Victor, did I answer you? I hope I did. And to make changes, and if you are, you are not familiar with the terminals, and what you can do is as follows. Go into the, this kind of file manager here and go into the home directory and tutorial input and DFT. And you can click the input file here. And you reopen the file and you can make changes here by typing something here. And you can save it by X. I will not save it in these cases, and you can run it again. I hope that I answered your question, Victor. But well, let me continue. Okay, so we are make we make use of two uh, MPA processes, and uh, for the TFT calculation, what we need, what we have at this point is only the K point parallelization. This is a parallelization in number for the number of K point in the irreducible Boulogne zone. But in this case, we'll, we only have two, so we'll just put here two. And we also have restart option. So if you put true, this restart true, then you can resume the calculation from, the check, uh, from a checkpoint, but default is false. So you can just put false here. And then, uh, for the, there is another dictionary, which is flap MVPT. So this is the input file specific to the flap MPPT. One example, uh, one important key is the CIF file. So in the COM DMFT, the you, can, you are supposed to provide the crystal structure information by using CIF file. So you can just let the code know where the CIF file is located. And here you can uh, set the, the number of the DFT iteration, but here I just set it uh, <coughs> to be 50 and for the flap MPT code, we are doing the dense linear density mixing. So in this case, I just put the linear mixing to be 0 0.1. And for the relativity calculation, we have three options. One is a non-relativity, uh, second one is scalar relativity, and the third one is fully relativistic. What I mean by fully relativistic is that we are using the drug equation uh, for our band structure calculation, but here I just set it one. And for the spin polarization, you can put it true or false, but here the default is false, and I put it false because it's sodium. And for the K point meshes, I you can put it five by five by five, but you can increase it more and more for the more better converged calculation. Okay, so so far so good, right, guys? Uh, I hope that you are okay, and let me continue. So because we finished our DFT calculation, so this will be the DFT calculation output file. So we have some of the flap MVPT output file together with the checkpoint directory where we save all the important file to resume the calculation. So we, we have good starting point here. So next step is to do the LDA plus DMFT calculation. So as I told you in the, in the lecture, uh, for the LDA plus CMFT, we have two different self-consistent loop. One is the uh, charge self-consistency within the DFT. And the second one is the DM DMFT self-consistent loop for the DMFT calculation. So what the codes do is as follows. Starting from the flap MVPT starting point, <clears throat> where we have well-defined conscient potential and density, we just calculate this band structure. And from there, we calculate the Banyer functions. So combine code calculate the, all the input file for the Banyer function construction, and we call the Banyer 90 packages. And from there, we just uh, minimize the total spread and we get the, the Banyer functions. And from there, we define what our correlated orbital is. Then from there, we calculate the <coughs> lattice screens function by embedding impurity self-energy as well as the, and, and subtracting double counted self-energy. And from there, we calculate the local Green's function. And from the local Green's function, we define our bias field. And from there, we, in, using the COMC, TQMC packages, we calculate the impurity self-energy. And using this impurity self-energy, we update the density. 
and we go back here. And if we solve this set constantly until we get the uh, fully converging solution, then there will be the answer. So, but here I stress that in the current setup of the COM DMFT, we are using uh, U and the U, which is the bosonic vice field and the, the double counting self energy uh, <coughs> set as a external parameters. Okay, then let's go into the LDA plus DMFT uh, directory and let's run the LDA plus DMFT calculation. So what you need to do is you need to move your directory. So CD, CD, go up and LDA DMFT. And if you do the LS here, then you will see three, uh, one input file and the two <coughs> subdirectories. And this two subtractory is the, for the visualization and the pen structure post-processing. It has contained the Python script and the, it has it contains the input file for the pen structure calculation. But for the DMFT side concept calculation, you don't need these two directory. And the only thing you need is only this com dmft.ini input file. And let's first run the calculation. But here I also stress that in the com dmft.ini file, here look at this, look at this subdirectory here. Okay, maybe I should turn on the Emacs. There is also a key for the MPF prefix. So if we are not using the if your number of cores is, num is different from two, should you should make changes on this value and you should run it. But I assume that you are okay now. And let's run it like this. Then it will just start, and the, the Python script will call the, all the modules we need to run the LD plus DMFT calculation one by one, and it will give us some answer. And while the codes are running in our virtual machine, let me explain the meaning of the all the keys in the uh, com dmft file. So for this particular runs, we have uh, this is the input file, <coughs> and we have three different Python dictionaries. One is a control, which is the same as the flap MVPT run, and we also have Banietta underscore Hamiltonian. This is for the Banietta function construction, and we also have impurity keys, which just tells us what kind of impurity problem. Uh, this is the input file for the com ctqmc. Uh, packages. So in the control file, we have keys like initial lattice directory where we are starting our DFT calculation from. So we, we already run the DFT calculation here and we can make choices of method and we can just choose whether we have spin of coupling in the system or not. And this is MPA prefix and we can define which orbital in which atoms are correlated. And we can just say whether we will restart the calculation or not. And here I just set it the number of iterations to be one to finish the calculation in time. <laughs> so I just set it to be one. And this is the some of the uh, parameters. And I will describe the meaning from next pages. So, so all you guys are okay, right? If you guys have any question or comment, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I hope that you guys are all okay. Okay, so in the control, we have so many different Python dictionary keys and we you should provide the value. So this first key is a method, but as I told you, there are four different methods, which is DFT, LQSGW plus DMFT, and LDA plus DMFT, and LQSGW plus DMFT. In these cases, it should be uh, LDA plus DMFT. And the second key, which is important, is initial lattice directory. So this is the, we should provide the pass to the DFT pre-run, but in these cases, it will be go up one, go to the parent directory and there will be DFT directory. So you can provide it in this way. And you can also tell the code which orbital is correlated. So the first number one is telling us that it is the first atom in the unit cell 
but in this case it's because we have only one sodium atom in the unit cell so that it should be always one but if you have multiple atom in the unit cell you should specify which atom is correlated but the index atom index should follow the order listed in the dft crystal structure dot sxf as your output of the dft run if it just print out crystal structure dot xsf file and from there you you will see the many different atoms and from the order should be uh, and the atomic index should follow the order in this file and in addition to atom you should specify which subshell is correlated you have four different choices one is s the other one second one is p and the third one is d and the last one is f subshell however in these cases we will treat the s orbital as our uh, our correlated orbital. However, this is not a typical choice of the correlated orbital because usually D subshell or F subshells are correlated. So in the real material calculation, other than this kind of demonstration purpose, you should try to find the transition metal or lanthanide or arcanide, and you should put D or F subshell. That is typical choice. And there is there is another dictionary which is impurity problem equivalence. This is for the case of when we have more than one correlated orbital in the unit cell. For example, for the case of iron selenide in the unit cell, we have two iron atoms. In the cases we have two different impurity problems because we have two different iron atoms there. However, to reduce the computational cost, we can treat the two the orbital problems sitting on different atoms equivalently. So in the cases, what we can do is we can put just the same number here. For the first one, it is one. For the first impurity problem, which is first atom, S orbital. And then the second, for the first problem, you can just treat them equally by putting the same number. So if, if the impurity problem equivalence key is the same, it means that they are equivalent. And if you are want to, but if we sometimes we can put the negative numbers, it means that they are related to time reversal symmetry uh, and the translational symmetry. So that using the negative number, you can treat the anti ferromagnetically ordered phase calculation. And for the maximum number of iteration, I just put one here uh, to just reduce computational cost. But usual default choice is fifty. And in my cases, our uh, LD plus CMFT runner already has been finished. So I hope that you also get this, the answer soon. But in the meantime, I will explain the all the input parameter meaning. Uh, I will continue to explain it. And for the spin orbital, we can, some of the system spin orbital coupling is important and you can set it true or false. If it is false, then if you say, for example, D is correlated orbital, then all the cubic spherical harmonics, not the, this kind of complex spherical harmonics will be the choice of our orbital sitting on each atom. However, if you set it to, then this kind of JMJ basis set will be the, our default choice of the correlated orbital which is sitting on different atoms. And for the MPI prefix, okay, I have one question from Alex. Okay, let me read the question. Okay, so I can show you the examples. Okay, so let me open the, uh, maybe what I can do is this. Okay, let me show you the example. I will open my terminal. I will open Emacs because I like Emacs. For your PSR uh, comes with tutorial and LD percent. So this is the tutorial you can get uh, once you download the com suite packages. And let's go here. All uh, right, I'd better do it in this way. Okay, let me open the file, Alex. 
So, it, you know, in my home directory, I will go to ESR. And I will go into the uh, com suite, com suite, com suite. Oh, here, com suite and tutorial. Uh, LD plus MFC and iron selenide. And I have PDF file. This is a tutorial which I have made for the iron selenide calculation. Okay, look, look, look this. So in the iron selenide cases, as I told you, there are two different iron atoms. So let's just say the first and second atom is two iron. And in the, we'll say that two iron atom, which is sitting <coughs> on different side, uh, both of them are impurity. We should solve it within, uh, within the uh, TMFT. But we want to treat them, these two different impurity problem equivalently, then we can say that, so look at this. For the, for the belly, we have the parentheses here, and we have two different uh, set of keys, 1D and 2D. And this 1D correspond to the, this first number one, and this 2D correspond to the, the second number one. But if these two numbers are the same, then they are equivalent problem. Does it make sense, Alex? Oh, that's good. Okay, I hope that you are in the same pages to me, with me, and let me continue. Okay, so as I told you in the COM suite package, uh, in the COM DMFT run, we should call many different modules like a flab MPT, COM bond, COM low H, and COM CTQMC. So in principle, different packages can use different MPI prefix. But if you don't want it, then you can just provide one MPI prefix. Then all the packages who, sh who should run within the MPI, they'll use the same MPI prefix. However, if you want some individual, if, if you want to provide individual, individual MPI prefix, then you can also provide using this so some of the keys. But their default value will be to say that this will be the same as this. And we also have restart option, and the default value is false. And um, for the calculation, after we get the impurity self energy, we um, do the linear mixing of the impurity self energy, but with the default mixing ratio is 0.5. And we, after we construct the Barnier function, we can renormalize Barnier function by providing energy cutoff. However, default is that we don't do it. So this is not an important parameter. Okay, so I have introduced you the important concept of for the control dictionary. However, for the Barnier function con construction, there is an important, important concept you should know. So for the Barnier function construction, we need two different energy window. One is so-called the frozen or inner energy window, and the other one important is the outer or disentanglement window. So when the Barnier packages are doing the minimi uh, minimization of the total spread, what they are doing is they are doing the minimization on the constraint. And the constraint is the uh, in the energy window, inner energy window eigenvalue of the, of the uh, band structure constructed from the Barnier function doesn't change. So we should provide these two different energy window for the Barnier function construction. But by default, if you do not provide the, the parameter, then the default choice is that for the inner energy window, we set it to be plus minus 10 EV from the chemical potential. And for the, uh, for the, for the outer energy window, we say that it is minus 10 from the chemical potential to the uh, plus 50 from the chemical potential. And, uh, and another important thing is that as a result of the, this inner and outer energy window, if you do the Barney interpolation of the band structure, if you make a comparison between the interpolated band structure, which is red, and the direct output of the TFT band structure, which is blue, as you can see here, in the, within the inner energy window, their band structure are matching exactly. However, beyond that energy, there is some mismatches, but this is what is intended. So don't worry about it if you see this. 
And for in these cases, what I did is uh, this is an example of nickel oxide. So here we have the number of bands in the inner energy window is 10 and the number of outer energy window is the 25. And if we try to construct the 12 orbitals, then this will be final answer and their atomic orbital shape is as intended. As you can see a nickel DG square is looking like DG square. And for the nickel XY, it is looking like XY and the band structure matches well within the only in the inner energy window. Okay, with this <laughs> understanding, so in the Ban underscore H matrix, Hamiltonian matrix uh, dictionary, we should provide some of the keys and values. First important thing is K-grid. So here what we do is uh, for the calculation of the for unified field or hybridization function, we want to do the results in a really fine K grid. However, for the for example, for the LKSGW run, we cannot do really fine grid calculation. So what we do is uh, we do the interpolation in a really fine grid. So in the converged run, here I said that it is five by five by five, but in the converged run in which I shared, I put it like 15 by 15 by 15. So you can increase as much as you want because we are doing the Banyan interpolation. And as I told you, important concept is frozen energy window, which is we can provide the minimum and the maximum. The reason why I set it to minus 15 is just for safety. And the, all the other parameters are set it uh, automatically. For example, important thing is that we have the disentanglement energy window, minimum and maximum. And we can also set it the number of iteration for the Banyan function minimization. So, and this is for the disentanglement part, a usual choice for the, uh, uh, <clears throat> for the, the total spread minimization, we set it to zero. And for the uh, disentanglement process, we, just, we set it to B contract. So usually this kind of choice, it was good enough from my experience. So you don't have to worry about it. And there is also another Python dictionary you should set that is impurity uh, dictionary. So in the impurity dictionary, if we go to the input file here, look here, I will open the Emacs. Uh, oh yeah, this is not what I want. So in the input file, here, if we go into there, first input, first important key is a temperature. So it just tells us what temperature we do the simulation. This is in, in the unit of Kelvin. And for each impurity problem, which is defined by the impurity problem equivalence key here. So if this pro impurity problem one, we can provide all the input, uh, input file for the CTPMC using this, the Python uh, dictionary in this impurity uh, dictionary. So for this particular one uh, impurity problem, we can provide, for example, what is the F0, which is the hub, which means the Hubbard U value we should use, and what is the nominal double counting we use for the double counting calculation, and we can set the uh, thermalization time in minutes, we can set the measurement time in minutes, and we can set the, the Green's function cutoff, which is described by the uh, by Corey. Uh, a few minutes ago, and we can set the, whether we will make uh, some approximation in the, our Coulomb interaction, whether it's bull or Ising and so on. So we can provide all the information here. If you go into some more details, so as we did, uh, so in the, for the, when you have different, more than one impurity problem in our unit cell, we just set whether they are equivalent or not using this kind of uh, key here. But for the, Impurity problem sitting on the, uh, for the one impurity problem, when you have more than one orbitals there, for example, D, we have five orbitals there. We might, sometimes we might be able to say that some of the orbitals are equivalent. For example, when you solve the nickel oxide calculation in, which is in the, in the, in the cubic symmetry, then there is T2D easy splitting so that we can treat all the T2G orbitals the same, and we, we can treat all the EG orbitals the same. So in that way, we can just provide such an equivalence between the orbitals using this impurity matrix. Okay, I will give you some of the example. This is the, but in these cases, 
this is only single orbital problem because we are treating S as our empirical problem. So, so it is hard to see. However, for the case of nickel oxide, we are treating five different impurity orbitals as our one impurity. But in these cases, we will treat these three orbitals the same if the number is the same, they are equivalent. And we treat the T2G orbital the same and we will treat the EG orbital the same. And if we put zero, it means that we will neglect that component. So in this way, we can just treat the impurity orbital equivalency in this way. But if you are, don't like this kind of idea and if you don't worry about it, then you can just neglect this key and the code will just set it up for you. And for the case, and the, but there is one important thing is the order of the, the, the basis set. For example, for the D orbital cases, we have five different orbitals, but the order is important. So the, for example, for the D, the order of the orbital will be X, Y, Y, Z, Z square, X, G, and X square minus Y square. And for the F orbital, where we have, for example, spin orbit couplings in it, then the I index will just, will be, uh, the M index will be the fastest and the I index will be the slowest index. Okay. And once we provide the Hubbard U value by providing F here, but we can still make a further approximation. Once we provide all the Slater integrals, then we can construct the Coulomb interaction tensor. But sometimes we do not want to go into this full version of the Coulomb interaction, but we want to neglect some of the terms. For example, if we set it Ising, then only ABBA or ABAB terms are non-zero and all the other terms will be neglected. And this F0 is the, the way to provide the, the Coulomb interaction using the Slater integral. And this is nominal n is to set up the double counting energy. If we set it one, then we will use one here for the double counting, nominal double counting energy. And we can set the uh, thermal radiation time and we can set the measurement time and we can set the green curve. Uh, for the case of LD plus CMFT, 10 EV is just enough. And for the case of the LKSGW plus CMFT, the cutoff should be more than 50 sometimes. Okay, so I hope that you guys all get the final answer by running the script. And I assume that you have the final answer and let's go into the, the object. So in the output directory, we have all different widgets. So first the command.log file has all the command the Python script has run. And this is the info file we have used. And the convergence log file, it has all the information of the convergence as a function of iteration. I will describe it later. And in the DC directory, we have information about the double counting. In this cases, we use a nominal double counting scheme so that its value will be just from that equation. And this delta.dat just have the hybridization function. And we have impurity directory where we have all the input and output of the CTPMC solver. And we have lattice directory where we have the flap MVPT runs. And we have low energy directory, which is the input and output for the com low H. And we have sigma.dat, which is impurity self energy. And we have Fania function directory where we have input and output for the Fania function calculation. And I have one question from Fabian. And... Oh, so, uh, so this is the, uh, his question is here for the, for the, this tutorial, I use F0 equal five. And where this, his question is where this value is coming from. This value is coming from the, some extension of the constraint DFT calculation. I just use the value which other people use this for this for this type of calculation for the sodium. Did I answer you, Fabian? Okay. There's also uh, F zero is essentially the Hubbard U. Yes, yes, yes. And the other ones um, are essentially J. Yes. Yes, but but yeah, uh, Fabian has a further question. Like, can you calculate the uh, 
uh, can you calculate the, this F0 and F2 and F4? Yes, of course. And that's the reason why we have COM DMFT modules, which calculate the, this uh, bosonic bias field from first principles within the CRP method. However, for the LE plus CMFT run, just we are treating them as a parameter. So, so we, in this case, we just use it as a parameter. Did I answer you? Okay. So this is the file structure of the convergence dialog, one of the output file of the com DMFT packages. Uh, first column is tells us what kind of step has been done at each iteration. And this is the iteration number. And this is the, the this is particular impurity problem number here. So we have one more question from Temujin. So his question, So his question is the, whether we can evaluate the magnetic exchange parameter. Uh, so I think his question is, Pemujin, I, I want you to clarify your question. So you want to ask if we can calculate the exchange J, which is the, uh, the, the exchange coupling between the orbital which is sitting in different atom, right? Is that your question? Can you say yes or no? <laughs> Did I answer you? Do I understand your question correct? Okay, so exchange J is the, uh, somewhat different issues. So what you need to do, one of the way TFT people are doing is they first calculate the total energies and by changing magnetic uh, moment at different sites, they just evaluate the, the the exchange coupling parameters. However, that is not able to do that within COM suite package yet. But, but we can calculate on-site U and on uh, Hunt coupling J, which is on-site value within constraint uh, RPA calculation. Did I answer you, Temujin? Okay, so we have one more question from Alex. Let me read it first. Okay, so the way how, so his question is how we do the magnetic system calculation. So how we do is as follows. For the initial part, we do not include the magnetic uh, uh, spin polarization. For example, if you want to do LD plus, uh, if you want to do antiferro magnetically ordered nickel calculation, the way how we do is we treat uh, the material as non-spin polarized in the initial level. However, we add the spin polarization in the DMFT level. Uh, I hope I answered your question, Alex. And there is one more question from uh, Temujin. And his question is whether we will implement the calculation of the uh, uh, exchange coupling uh, near, in the near future. Uh, I would say may maybe not in the near future, but that could be the, some topic we can do in the future, but we don't have any specific plan, plan for that. I think I answered your question, Temujin, right? So let me uh, continue. Okay, so here, this is the file format of the convergence the log file. So we have the, all the different <coughs> module we have called during the calculation. And this is the iteration number. And this is the impurity number here. Uh, for every iteration for the impurity or delta calculation, we check its causality. And uh, it just says at each iteration of TFT how the, the density changes. And we also calculate the binary function at every TFT iteration so that we just check how the uh, maximum spread of the binary function and minimum spread of the binary function changes as a function of iteration. And we also check how the chemical potential changes as a function of iteration. And we also calculate the, the, how the self energy changes as a function of different iteration. Here, J is the iteration number and I is the orbital number. So we are calculating the standard deviation of the self energy at each iteration. And we also check the number of electron in the impurity side as a function of iteration, so you can check it. And this is the histogram information for the QMC 
this is the first moment and this is the second moment. So we can check how the calculation converges. You also print out the CTQMC sign at every iteration. So you can just check how the CTQMC sign changes. So basically this is the only part you should pay attention to, to check the convergences. We have all the information about all the quantities. So if you take a look at it, then you can check whether uh, your calculation has been converged or not. But here I stress that for this demonstration, for this hand-drawn session, I just set it to be external number of iteration to be one so that it just stops here in your cases. Okay, so the output. First output, important output is the impurity self-energy. So impurity self-energy is contained in C.DAT.D.85. The first column is frequency in much water axis. And second column is the uh, real part of self-energy. And the third part is the imaginary part of self-energy. So we, because we have only one atom, we only have three columns here. So let's plot it. So to plot it, what you need to do is go to the analysis directory where I have Oh, I think I moved it. So in, the, in my case, I should go like this and just run the Python script like this. So then you will see the, how the self energy is looking like. This is the wrong result I got from the one iteration. However, if we run it self consistently and if we get this converged solution, then this is the answer. So we have almost flat like severe part of self energy and it becomes to linear in frequency in much water axis. And for the imaginary part of self energy, it is somewhat linear near the chemical potential. However, we have upturn and it goes to the zero value here. But the important thing is that there is no divergence near the chemical potential. So it means that um, this solution is a little, uh, uh, Fermi liquid like and up to 2 EV, we might just assume that our self energy is linear in frequency. Okay, so next important uh, output is hybridization function. So for the plot, I will close the window by clicking X here, like this. And this is the output format of the hybridization function file. So first column is the frequency and second column is the real part of the hybridization function. And the third column is the imaginary part of hybridization function. And so let's plot it using the command. Oh, I, I, I see, I didn't close it. Okay. So in this directory, stay in the directory and run python delta.py. So if you see any problems when you are following the instruction, just let me know. And if we plot it, then we have two plot. One is real part of delta and next one is the imaginary part of delta. And this is the plot from the fully converted calculation. So we, this is real part and this is the imaginary part but one thing we can see here is the imaginary part of the delta is finite near the zero frequency. It means that there could be hopping of the electron between the path and an impurity. <clears throat> so it means that this material is metallic behavior. Okay, so we have, we just have seen the, some of the output file and it's time to calculate the band structure. So what you need to do is go into the band directory and check the input file there. Then there is one input file, which is comdmft.ini. So that, and now it's time for you to run uh, the script. Okay, I run it and the calculation finishes. I hope that it's the same for you. And this is the input file for the comdmft uh, band structure calculation. So we, there is also two different uh, <coughs> uh, Python dictionary with the name of the control and the post-processing. So in the control, we say what can, method we use for the, for the, for the COMDMFT script. So in this case, it's because we are doing the band structure calculation. So that we will say that this is band and we provide the MPI prefix for the calculation. 
And for the post-processing, we should let the code know where our fully converged LD plus DMT calculation results. And we say that it is in the, in, in the parent's directory. And at the same time, because band structure calculation, you should provide a k-point path. But however, if you do not provide, then code just automatically uh, get the k-point path, which is defined by in this paper. But if you want to provide it manually, then you can also do that. And format is the same as, as like this. First line is empty. And second line is saying that the k path is fractional and is with respect to the lattice vector. And this is just saying, telling that we have by 60, uh, 650 number of k points. And this is the k point number. And this is k point uh, information. And we have question from, uh, this is not the question. Uh, Vincent have some comment to Temujin, so I will skip it. Okay, then let's plot it. For the plot, let's go into the analysis directory and let's plot it using the Python script, which is band.py. And this is the plot you should get here. And this is find fully converged data. As you can see here, LDA just telling us that at the gamma point, the, the, the energy is about 3.3 .3, and LD plus CMFT calculation, it just tells us this on more or less the same results. And this is the benchmark calculation within the LDA. They were so some, from this paper, they are saying that it is 3.3. .3, and if you use the, if they use different exchange correlation function now, then it is 3.29 and sometimes it's four, but the experimental value is 2.65. However, if they use different double counting scheme, in this cases, they use the exact so-called exact double counting scheme is 2.8. And within the G naught, W naught, it is 3.15. So you can see that for this particular uh, topic, which is the bandwidth of the simple metal, double counting is really important. If compared to this, if we compare their calculation and our calculation, the only difference is the double counting scheme. But if you use different double counting scheme, sometimes you will be able to get 2.8, which is much closer to the experiments. Okay, this so far, this is the end of the, the LDA Pro CMLK tutorial. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I will have three minute break. <laughs> And as an advertisement, I strongly recommend you to go into the tutorial directory here. And there will be other examples based on the for the iron selenide and microxide, which is much, much more fun than sodium. So I hope you to run it and get some idea how this code works and how, <coughs> how this methodology works and so on. And if you have any questions, you can contact me using Slack anytime or you can send me an email anytime and I will wait for your uh, contact. I take a deep breath for one minute and I will continue to do LQS G double plus MFT tutorial. So, so far so good, right? <laughs> because this is online so I cannot feel how you are doing. <laughs> so I feel like I'm talking to the wall. <laughs> well, I hope you guys are okay. Okay, Daniel, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, after one minute, I will start the tutorial for the LQSGW plus DMT. Oh, uh, Patrick had one question like, is there any documentation on the submission via HBCQ system? So the only thing you need to do is instead of, so the way how we are uh, running the command is this, right? Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. The way how we run the, the com DLT for the tutorial is as follows, right? by using this command, Patrick. But instead of this, in the job submission, at the end of job submission script, you can just put this command in it. And for the, for the MK prefix in the com dmft.i9, 
you can just put the slum uh, chop submission script like S run. I don't know what was it. S run. Uh, you can just put there. For example, if, let's see if I had the example here. I can this here. Uh, yes, our commit in home suite uh, tutorial. Yes, uh, this is one example to submit the job. So at the end of the slum uh, job submission script, you can just put the same command as this. And at the same time, in the com dmft dyna, you can just put this npf prefix, uh, which is the scope for your jobs uh, scheduler. Did I answer you, Patrick? Okay, so, so in the MPI job submission script, you can do this here and you can do this here. Yeah, okay, he likes it, so I like it. Okay, so let me continue for the LQS plus DMFT tutorial. Okay, so the basic idea is the same. So input file for the LKS GW plus TMFT run will be, <clears throat> it has been set up to run on two CPU cores in an hour. So that if you wanna, it means that the final answer you will get by running, following this tutorial will be not fully converted, but this is for the demonstration purpose. But if you want to see the fully converted calculation results, it is located here. It is located here. And <clears throat> another comment is that sodium is not the best material to show the power of the RT uh, methodology. But I just picked it because it is numerically really cheap and it can be done really quickly. Okay, so the goal is in this case is we will first run the LQS GW plus DMFT set constant calculation. And then instead of band, we will, we will calculate the spectral function. Okay, so for that, let's move to the directory. First, we should do the LQS GW plus DMFT free run. So what you need to do is go move to tutorial input LQSGW. And if you check the if you check what is inside, then there is one input file and one crystallographic information file here. But go into the detail first, let's run the calculation. So Let's run it. Then the code will generate the input file for the flap MPPT. And at the, after that, they will run the flap MPPT calculation, uh, TFT, as well as the LQS GW run. OK, so this is the, what we have in comdmft.ini. This is also the same format as the input file for the TFT calculation. So first the dictionary is control and second dictionary is flap MPPT and we have all the key and value combination here. Okay, let's go into detail. <clears throat> for the control dictionary, we have first case the method. Of course, this you can pick one of these four choices. Uh, in this case, it's because we will do the LQS GW calculation. So it will be LQS GW. And for the MPA prefix, in our cases, we should use MPA run, so MPA run MP2, but this two uh, is the maximum number of cores you can use in the virtual machine in these cases. But for the LQS GW calculation, we have uh, MPI grid parallelization. What it means is that we have two dimensional grid for the MPI uh, parallelization. 
one dimension is for the K point and the other one is for the much broader uh, time, uh, frequency and time. But because we only have two number of two cores available, so that I will say that for the K point parallelization, we will do nothing. However, for the tau parallelization, we will say this will be two. So important thing is that if you multiply these two number, then this should be the same as number here. And for the restart option, I will say that this is false, but if you want to resume the calculation, of course you can do. Uh, and for the flap MPPT keys, uh, this is the uh, dictionary. We have key and value combination here. First, we need to sp specify where there's a uh, crystal crystallographic input file is there. So it is sodium file will be there. And the number of DFT iteration will be 50. And I will just do LQS, LQS GW iteration will be one in these cases for to see the results quickly. And for the DFT uh, density mixing, we'll just do linear mixing. And this will be linear mixing coefficient will be 0 0.1. And relativistic uh, coefficient will be one. And this will be non spin polarized calculation. And K mesh will be five by five by five. And for the GW calculation, we are doing the linear mixing for the self energy. But in this case, the coefficient will be 0 0.1, which is set by default. OK, so it will take a little bit longer time than DFT calculation. I hope that in the meantime, we will get the answer. <clears throat> but this is the flow chart of the how the COM DMFT packages do the LQS plus LQS GW plus DMFT calculation. So we are starting from the flap MPPT LQS GW plus LQS GW calculation. And from there, we get the final converted quasi particle Hamiltonian and quasi particle wave functions here. Then, first from there, we construct a Banyev function out of it. And using this Banyev function information and the wave function, we calculate the partially screened plume interaction. And from there, we get the bosonic bias field. And then we calculate the double counting self energy using the COM DC packages. So we have Hatchery term and we have exchange correlation term within local GW approximation. And collecting all this information, we from the COM low H, we calculate both fermionic bias field. And from the CTPMC, we get the impurity self energy. And if we solve this self consistently, then there will be a fully converted LKS G double plus DMFT calculation results. Okay, so my laptop tells me that LKS GW calculation has not been done yet. So let's wait until the calculation finish it. And if you have any questions, just let me know. We have some time <laughs> until the LQS GW calculation finish it. I hope that it finishes soon. Okay, we have one more question from Hongbin. So he asked about the how we can interface COM CTQMC packages to other DFT based DFT packages. So as far as I know, there is no universal uh, interface we are using yet but what i can tell you is that <clears throat> if the package you are interested in uh, already have some interface to other ctkmc server the info file information will be almost the same so that you can make use of com ctkmc i think <clears throat> uh Corey, if i'm wrong please correct me and hongbin i hope that i answered your question Okay, so there's one question. Yes. Corey had to bow out because he uh, had another meeting. So I'm okay. taking over. Okay, um, I, I, but, but probably uh, what I said is right. And yeah. I have one more question from Alex. And in the meantime, our LQS GW has been finished, it, which is good. And Alex's question is as follows. 
So he asked whether I have tested charge transfer system like uh, Atlantan Nickel O3. So unfortunately, I do not know exactly what does it mean by a charge transfer system. So I'm talking about the charge transfer between the uh, nickel D and oxygen P probably. And if that is the case, I, I would say I, I did. I did lantern copper oxide, which is one of the charge transfer insulator. In the cases, it converted well. Did I answer you, Alex? I didn't, I didn't catch whether you got, whether you answered the question from Patrick Thomas about, uh, uh, maybe you did. I, I did, I did. About, I, and then prefix Q systems, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, so he said within the TMT two nickel atom have plus three plus, but TMT plus zero or uh, nickel S two and four. Uh, for this particular system, I do not have good understanding. Probably there is two nickel atom in the unit cell. However. Their valence are different. Uh, charge disproportionation. Uh, I have not. I haven't. I don't. I didn't have applied our packages to such a system. Yeah, I don't have experience for this particular problem. But judging from what Hyo Won got in University of Chicago. He did some of the study on the lantern nickel O3, if I remember correct. And he got some of the research, which is published in PRB and if I don't, uh, PRL probably. So I think in general, a TFT plus TMFT method should work on such kind of uh, so-called charge transfer system, I think, Alex. Okay. Sorry, I I got a private question about uh -huh. whether whether we can do a fairy magnetic system. Oh, uh, fairy magnetic. Fairy magnetic. No, means. No. Fairy magnetic system requires really large supercell. Mm -hmm. We don't have support for that yet. Okay. 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 So because our calculation LQS GW calculation has been finished. So then let's go to the LQS G plus DMFT calculation. So what you need to do is so go into the first you need to move your directory, do CD, LQS GW DMFT, and check the input file there. We have one input file which is com DMFT, and we have a subdirectory there, but they are not essential for the LQS G plus DMFT run, but they are just for the plot and real axis calculation. And let's run the command. So command will be com dmt com sweet bin dot com dmt dot pi. Yeah, it is working, which is good. And let's continue. Okay, while the code is running, we should check the all the input file. This input file is almost the same for the input file, LD plus MFT uh, input file. However, there is some differences. For example, for the impurity part, we don't have to specify the, the Hubbard U or double counting value. We, they will be calculated. So there is no F naught. Uh, key or there is no nominal and key here. But just to remind you, I will go through all the keys one more time. This will be boring, but sorry, I have to do it. So first key is the LQS GW method, but there is you have four different choices, but in this case, it will be LQS GW plus DMFT. And second key will be the, the lattice directory for the Initial lattice directory where we run the LKS GW. So in these cases, we say that it is located here, which we already calculated here. And the impurity problem will be the same. First key is the impurity atom number, and second key is the orbital type. You can put just one S here. And then if you have more than one 
uh, impurity problem there, then you can specify whether they are equivalent or not. But in these cases, we have only one orbital correlated orbital, so that you can just put one there. And you can specify how many iterations you go through. Uh, but for the for the fast calculation, I just said one after one iteration code will stop for the demonstration. And then Temujin also have one more question. So he, his question is how big the system he, we have handled so far. So for the LQS GW plus symmetry calculation, I would say that 10 atom in a units will be the maximum. And then for the LDA plus it will be better. Uh, however, we have not tried more than 10 atom yet. Uh, but the biggest system we have applied is, uh, let's say 10. So could you, would you be willing to say what a particular material is with the uh, it was atoms? Oxide. Pardon me? Lantanic copper oxide with, with distortion. So in the particular system, it was, we had 14 atoms in it. Uh, did I answer you, Temujin? I think I did. <laughs> okay, let me continue. Okay. So, so we further, for the definition of the correlated orbital, we can have two different choices. One is the real spherical harmonics, and the other one is JMJ basis set. You can specify, you can make choices by the spin orbit keys here. And we can provide the MPI pre prefix universally, or if you want, you can provide specific MPI prefix individually for different components of the COM DMFT packages. And you can also specify whether you want to restart the calculation or not, what default is false. And sigma mixing ratio is the uh, is a key for the self energy linear mixing. Default choice is 0.5, but it was so far so good. And the number of iteration I uh, can specify in this way here. Yeah. Okay. So second important uh, dictionary is Kong Abanyet underscore Hamiltonian. So important quantity is the, the interpolated K point grid. So usual choice it will be 10 by 10 by 10, but however, in this cases for the fast calculation, I set it to be five by five by five and for the memory issues too. And then we have, we can define the frozen energy window minimum and maximum. For some cases, the minimum, <coughs> uh, usually 10 by, minus 10 to 10 is good enough, but sometimes the balance band go below uh, then minus 10 EV, so minus 15 to 10 is also reasonable. So there is other keys, but they are, will, will be set up by default. And the, for the impurity key, it will be the same. The important parameter is the temperature in Kelvin. Usually 300 is, is normal choices, but however, for this particular run, I picked the 900 for the fast convergences, and uh, we can provide the equivalence information between impurity orbitals, but in these cases, because we have only S orbitals, so that just one will be enough. And for the Coulomb calculation, after we get the bosonic bias field from the CRPA, we can make a further approximation, uh, which means that we have four in this is Coulomb interaction tensor, but we can make a further approximation such that we just neglect uh, any term other than ABBA or ABAB will be zero. So if we put Ising, then we can make a such an approximation. So I have one more question from Hongbin. Let me read it first. Mm -hmm. So yeah, of course. So his first question is uh, whether, so there is an important concept which is not important for this <coughs> particular demonstration with the sodium, but there is an important concept of the local axis transformation, which I will not deal with in this tutorial. However, Hongbin, if you go into the uh, iron selenide example in the tutorial, 
in the which is distributed together with packages, you will see that uh, they will tell you how to do the basis transformation. Okay. Uh, Temujin, there is one more question from Temujin, and he asked whether we can do mangan for nitrogen, which is very magnetic system. Uh, I have never tried, in principle, it can with current setup. However, it will be demanding. So uh, my answer is in principle with the code distributed, yes, but however, in reality, I don't know. Why were Tomino unit cell? Uh, uh, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I think I was wrong. So for the ferry magnetic, it means that uh, in some sense, ferry magnetic calculation will be more similar to the ferromagnetic calculation than the anti ferromagnetic calculation. So in that cases, I would say that it is not possible with the current distributed uh, packages. Yeah, that will be my answer, Temujin. Did I answer you, Temujin? It's the ferromagnetic is, is not possible. Ferro, ferromagnetic is not possible yet in, for, the, for the one I distributed. Okay. Okay, so let me continue. And at the same time, for the impurity, we can set up the summarization time and we can also set up the many, many, uh, measurement time in minutes as Corey described. And we can, we can provide Coulomb cutoff. I think the Coulomb cutoff in this case is 20 for this particular uh, S-orbital system. However, for the other system, usually 50 is good enough. And we can also provide successfully cutoff, which is default value 300. OK, so code is still running. But let's just assume that you get the full answer. And this is the final output uh, directory. Okay, so in the directory, we have command log where it contains all the command log, log, command log. And we have input file and we have also convergence.log and we've come, uh, we have clone directory where we have input and output for the uh, CIPA calculation. We have a DC directory for the double counting energy calculation. And we have delta.dat, which shows us hybridization function. And we have Impurity directory where we do the all the comps if QMC runs in it. And we have low H directory where we do the photonic vice field calculation. And we have a final output of the sigma uh, impurity self energy. And this is double counted self energy, which is frequency dependent. And we also have a hot for contribution of the double counting self energy. And we also have the photonic vice field use later. And then, then, and we also have fully screened Coulomb interaction information, which is W Slayer. And the V Slayer is a high frequency limit of the, the bosonic vice field. And in the Banye, we have output uh, for the Banye function construction. Okay. So this is the shape, uh, the structure of the convergence log. So in the first column, we just specify all the stuff the code are doing. First part is Banye, second part is Coulomb calculation, third part is double counting, and we do delta impurity, delta impurity, which means the, the DMFT self constant loop here. And every iteration, we check the, the causality. A uh, code says causality is good, and we just print out the the static value of the bosonic vice field for the F0 term, the value is this. And this is a minimum spreading among the older constructed Banyer function. And this is maximum spreading. And it just tells us the, how the chemical potential changes as a function of iteration. And it just tells us also the, how the self energy changes by using this kind of definition of the self energy changes. And it tells us impurity orbital occupation at each iteration. And this is first moment of the histogram. And this is the second moment of the histogram. 
and you print out the CTKMC sign at every iteration. Uh, okay. So code is still running. So I think we'd better wait until the calculation uh, finishes. So is there anyone whose calculation has been finished it here? No. Ah, oh, there's one guy, a Jake says that his calculation has been finished here. That's good. And let's just wait until my calculation has just been finished. Here. Will be finished. Okay, okay, guys. But at least code is running, right? <laughs> it didn't crash. That's good. So after this com low wage calculation, it will do com ctqmc and code will start. Okay, we have one more question from Alex. So for the his question is this. I mean, the, for the particular, I mean, the, so in the tutorial, I have a necrox side, and his question is whether I include the do vital in the binary decision step while I consider all the two p three d. So if I understand, if I remember correct, the, the I included just it, Alex. It will be determined by the energy window you provide. It will be determined by the the frozen energy window we provide to the code, and then. In the cases, code just automatically uh, just kick the basis set, localize orbital, which is important in that energy window. So for the tutorial cases, if I put minus 10 to 10 EV as a frozen window, then the choice of the orbital will be nickel S, nickel P, nickel D, oxygen S, and oxygen P. We have all of this. And after the binarization, we have all these <coughs> binary functions. And from there, I will pick the nickel D as my correlated orbital. Okay, thank you very much. So in my case, it's running CTQMC. So I said the code will run for three minutes. So in three minutes, we'll get the answer. So Alex, so here I stress that the so choice of the orbital will be determined, automatically determined by the choice of the frozen energy window. The code will just pick it for us. Okay, maybe in two to three minutes, we'll get the answer. Okay, we have one more question from Daniel. Oh, no, no, Daniel. So default choice, his question is whether we do the binary interpolation of LQS GW band structure for the LQS GW plus DMFT. So by default, the package do the binary interpolation. But what I told you is that for this particular demonstration purpose, we don't do that. Uh, because for the binary interpolation, then we will have much more Hamiltonian we should deal with for the calculation of the Fermionic bias field. It will be time consuming and memory consuming so that we didn't do that. But by default, the code do the binary interpolation. It is the same uh, for the LD plus CMLT calculation. If there is anything unclear, please let me know. We have some time. So we have one more question from Patrick. Let me read it first. Well, first thing is, so uh, my calculation has been finished. Okay, his question is. Okay, so his question is whether we can do structural, uh, we can find the, the minimal free energy structure we using palm suite. The answer is we cannot do that. So in some sense, it comes we just treat the crystal structure as the, which one is given. So my usual 
the flow of work is that if I'm interested in some material, then I look for the experimental crystal structure and I just use it. Did so, I answer you, Patrick? Um, on the other hand, uh, the version of, of uh, Andre's code that, that is on the virtual machine um, now has forces on it. So you yes, yes, it yes. That's also good for point. the DFT calculation, not for yes, the GW, yes. GW, only for DFT. So you could you could uh, script that and use the forces mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. optimize. Mm -hmm. the... Yes, as as, as uh, Vincent said, there are many packages if you can do those, uh, the uh, relaxation within the density functional theory. And there is also uh, one package we can do the relaxation within the LDA plus CMFT, which is the, the Christian, Christian Howless package at Locust University. And there is one more question from Hongbin. Let me read it first. Oh, uh, so I don't think I understood your question. Let me read it carefully. Uh, okay, Hongbin, so maybe I can, what I can remind you is the, how we do the CRPA. So when you do CRPA, we just get rid of the so-called low energy polarizability. So here I define the low energy polarizability as a transition between only the correlated orbital. So in that sense, uh, but, but for the U calculation, there are two different, uh, the, 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 the part which is important. One is the how the such kind of renormalized fence, uh, Coulomb interaction is looking like. And the other one is how the orbital we are constructing uh, is, how big is it? So from the point of the CIPA, Renormalized Coulomb interaction itself doesn't change whether we will use large energy window or small energy window or whatever. However, but the wave function is finally constructed, the Banyan function itself, the size depends on the energy window. If we construct a Banyan function in a small energy window, then Banyan function will be extended. However, if we construct a Banyan function in a large energy window, then our final constructed uh, binary function will be really tightly bound to the atom side. So I think if you're asking about this, I don't know if I understand your question correctly or not, but if there is some dependence on the U and J value or on the choice of the energy window, then most, it should be mostly coming from the size of the localized orbital. Did I answer you? Understood, okay, that's good. Okay, in the meantime, we have final answer, uh, finally converted LQS uh, GW plus DMT calculation. So that's good. So let's first take a look at the dynamical U value. So here, I, if we open uh, use, for example, oh, here. if I type cat u slater.dat, and this is the file format, the first column is a much better frequency, bosonic much better frequency, and second column is F0 value. However, if we're treating D or P or F0 system, there will be more than F0, there will be F0, F2, and F4, and so on. And if we open the voice later that the AT file, and it, it just tells us how the high frequency limit is, and the high frequency limit in this case is, is 6.72. And let's plot it. Okay, so if we go to the analysis directory, oh, I, I already moved. If you go into the analysis directory and type Python u omega dot pi, yeah. Then you will get this plot. And this, this blue plot is the fully screen column interaction. And this red plot is partially screen column interaction, which is U value we will use. And this black dashed line is a bare column interaction limit. So one thing we can see here is that 
partially screen, screen chrome interaction is always higher than fully screen chrome interaction value. And at high frequency value, they are matching almost well to each other and they will converge to this high frequency limit, which is expected. And another plot quantity we should, we can plot is self energy. So in the self energy point, we have frequency, a real part and imaginary part of self energy and let's plot it. Python, sigma, dot pi. So if we plot it, we have two figures. One is the real part and the other one is our imaginary part. And for the red, red color means impurity self energy and the, the blue means double counting self energy. As you can see here, they are more or less similar. However, there is some differences. And one thing important, one important quantity to measure the correlation is G factor. But because the self energy from impurity is shows us, us much steeper slope here, so it means that within the TMFT, G factor will be the smaller. So within the TMFT, we get more correlation than the local GW. And another important thing is that up to 5 EV, your part is flat and the major part is linear. So then maybe we can apply the linear approximation up to 5 EV. And for the hybridization, we get the answer. So we will plot it. So Python. Uh, delta dot pi. So if we plot it, then this is real and imaginary part of uh, hybridization function. Uh, as in the case of the LD plus CMFT, we get the metallic hybridization function because the uh, imaginary part of the hybridization function near zero frequency is non-zero here. Okay, so next beast is the uh, analytical continuation. So all our formalism are done on a Majvara or imaginary frequency and the, the time axis. So it means that if we wanna plot it some quantity on a real axis, so we should do the analytical continuation. So there are many different methods to do the analytical continuation, such as Maxent, which is a maximum entropy method, as well as PADE, which is just expansion of the self energy uh, using the, the, the continuous fraction. Uh, maybe terminology could be wrong, but, but <clears throat> for this particular demonstration, we will use package developed at KAIS in Korea. And in the COM3 packages, we have Leper. Uh, we can use the, the packages easily. So that package has been installed already. So let's make a directory and we run it. So go to the parent directory on the LQS GW plus DMFT here and make maxent directory, make mkdir maxent and go into maxent. And the way how you can run the calculation is by using this command, which is com sweeping mqm wrapper, and you just specify where the self energy is located. However, we'll skip this step because it will take about 10 minutes. And maybe you can run it after the, this tutorial session as a homework, but I will provide you the fully converged calculation, full, a final answer in this directory. So for the for the visualization of data, we'll use this data, but maybe you can run it using this command <clears throat> after the tutorial. It will take about 10 minutes. So we will go into the analysis directory and we will run the Python script, Python, seek rear axis, pi. So this is a real and imaginary part of self energy on a real axis. So what you can see there is that for the real part, it's almost linear of within the mind plus minus 10 EV. And for the imaginary part, it is almost zero here, but we have some small kink, um, which means that we have some small pores there. But overall, maybe we can just safely uh, neglect the, this feature. Uh, for the understanding, however, for the numerical calculation, 
I will just use this feature for the whole, whole numerical value for the spectral function calculation. Okay, so next step is for the spectral function calculation. So we have finally convert, fully converted the LKS GW plus DMT data, and we also have self energy on our rear axis. So it means that we can calculate the spectral function on our rear axis. So go into rear axis directory, which I created for you already, and check what is inside by using ls command. And there is only one or two file. One is comdmft.ini, which is the input file for the spectral function. And the other one is kpoint path, uh, which is we, along which we plot the spectral function. And let's run the calculation. So it will be com suite. Com suite bin com dmft.py. And code will run. And maybe in one or two minutes, the code will be finished. In the meantime, let's take a look at what is in, in the input file. In the control dictionary, we also have, we should specify the method. In this case, it's for the spectral function, you should say spectral. But for this post-processing step, you have three choices, band, which is a band structure calculation. Second one is density of say those. And the final one is spectra. And you should specify the MPEG prefix. In this case, it will be like this. And for the post-processing dictionary, you should provide where the comes with uh, calculation directories. In this case, it's parents directory. And you should let the code know where the, uh, where the uh, fully uh, uh, analytic, uh, where the, where the self-energy on a rear axis, then it is located here. And we can put the arbitrary broadening for the for the for the iterant state. In this case, I say that it is 10 millib. This is EB unit, and you can specify k points. However, if you do not provide k point, then comes to follow the path defined in this paper. Okay, so let's plot the spectral function. So let's go to the analysis directory. And let's run the Python and Spectra. So we will complain something, but it's okay. And you will get the spectral function, which is looking like. Here I plotted spectral function in more path. Uh, so this is G, H, N, G, P, H, P, N path. And uh, this, the spectral function is just shown in using this intensity plot. And the LKS GW band for comparison is this lead line. As you can see here, there is a little bit of the renormalization of the math. So in this case, is the, at the comma point, the energy will be about 2.9. And uh, without, within our LKS GW plus, oh, this should be LKS GW. Within our LKS GW calculation, the band width is about 2.9, and this is almost the same accuracy as EDMFT uh, results. However, both of the calculations are still far from the exponential value of 2.65. And this is all the material that I have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that you didn't see any problem while you following the tutorials. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, or just let me know now. <laughs> okay, there is one question. Uh, for the low and high energy polarization data, it is just used internally, it is in the mo memory, but it has never been printed it out. Uh, but Daniel, if you want, I can work with you to print it out. Yeah, it is not a, uh, not a lot of efforts. Actually, before we was printing that, but I just decided to not to print it. Okay, so we have a question from Fabian. Uh, 
so Fabian, before answer your question, uh, there is one question to you. That is, when you say eDMFT, does it mean the extended DMFT or or the uh, extended DMFT, not the eDMFT, which is defined by Christian, right? Uh, yeah, of course we can do that. But when we started it, we wanted to really, we wanted to go with a simpler route, and that's the reason why we just go with the DMFT. And yeah, that's my answer. But of course, yes, because from the CIK, we can get the all the non-local part, so we can go with the EDMFT too. But in the cases, one of the difficulty will be that we should have a bosonic set consistent loop, but <laughs> there will be one of the beasts we should deal with. Okay, so there is Fabian's question, and there is one more question from Wei Yi. Uh, he asked about the future plan, whether we want to add a ladder diagram of GW like BSC, but uh, our future plan is as follows. We are now we are working on the um, realizing full version of the GW plus EDMFT. It is not, uh, not like multi-tier GW plus EDMFT approaches. However, we are working on the realizing full GW plus EDMFT loop in an initial fashion. We are working on it and hopefully you will get the, we will share the final product soon. I think Wei Yi was asking about calculating the polarization. There's a lot of interest in people who want to know about the polarizability and the susceptibility. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's think, not I the way true. we want to go. But the well, way we want to go is to, to just doing the full GW plus EDMFT. That's my answer. No, no, I have a different answer. Uh -huh. um, so in in Andre's code, um, either from uh, either version that you have on the VM, uh, they do calculate, uh, and in particular, the version from a year ago uh, can calculate the polarizability and make uh, give you data to make graphs of the polarizability. Yes, that's what Flap MVPT does, and uh, but for the COM suite packages, we will go with the uh, full GW plus EDMFT in the near future. Right, I, I, I think we already got that point. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is that from Andre's code, if you just want the polarizability, um, you can he, you can do a BSC calculation, and I believe that will give you the polarizability in yes, yes. BSC. Yes. Um, or vertex corrections. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I don't know, I, I'm a uh, song about um, when you're doing the, uh, the full GW plus DMFT, will you then be able to, to output the polarizability, including both the DMFT contribution and the GW contribution to the of polarizability? Of course. Okay. okay. If there is any other questions, and thank you for your attention. And if you have any further question on the Com Suite or Com DMFT packages, please leave us a message in in Slack. Yeah, could we hold on another five minutes? Sometimes it takes five the, minutes. To oh, so wait, there is one more question from Wei Yi. Yes, yes, we are working on it. His question is whether we develop code within the GW plus EMFT. Yes, my answer is we are working on it. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. It, it will be full self consistency in the full Hilbert space. Thank you very much, guys, for your attention.
I hope you guys enjoy Com Suite packages. Yeah. Okay, I will close the Zoom. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. See you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm.